the RDA really should cover 97.5% of the population. You would want the population consuming the RDA to feel confident that only 2.5% of the people are deficient. And they never do that. Why? Because because when policy was set in place, the concern was if we tell everyone that the mean intake of the population is a concern for all the nutrients, everyone's going to go to GNC or Walmart or whatever, and they're going to be buying boatloads of nutritional supplements or cabinets are going to look like yours and mine. And then we're going <laughs> to, then our problem is going to be everyone has vitamin A toxicity or niacin toxicity or whatever. And so, and so as a result of that, if you go back and look at how the RDAs were calculated, the key missing piece of evidence is what is the variation in the requirement? So in almost every case, they did not have any data on what the variation in the requirement was. So what did they assume? That one standard deviation is 10%. So almost every RDA is the EAR times 1.2 because they just assume that, the vari- that a standard deviation is 10% of the average. The problem is Every single case where they had evidence about what the variation in the requirement was, it was way higher than 10%. Hey, everyone. I am super excited to have on the podcast Chris Masterjohn. Chris is a legend in nutrition. That's what I would consider him. Really, he's been around for quite a while, uh, probably 20 years in the space, reading about nutrition Maybe longer, he could correct me if it's longer than that. But he's been reading about nutrition for quite a while. And he also then got a PhD in nutrition from the University of Connecticut and also served as a professor in nutritional sciences at uh, actually the university that I went to, uh, CUNY Brooklyn College. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, but that's interesting. I've been following his work. I had him on a a, a podcast before. And uh, he's really a a wealth of knowledge and... uh, I really think he, he's got a lot of great information that I'd like to pick his brain on. So thanks for coming. And, thanks uh, for having me. Let's, let's get started. Let's do it. Okay. So first question, you do a lot of research on nutrition supplements. I want to try to get an understanding of what you take, and that's kind of going to you know just uh, enlighten me on kind of your worldview on different kinds of supplements. Sure. But yeah. Uh, right now, I have a pretty limited supplement stack. So I generally take uh, some desiccated liver capsules and some oyster extract capsules, which are kind of um, my multivitamin, if you will. And then I, I take a little bit of whole food vitamin C because I generally don't quite hit the target that I would want for vitamin C. Uh fall shy a little bit of it. And then I take a vitamin K2 supplement because I have a genetic polymorphism that slows my recycling of vitamin K. And so I want a little bit extra of that. Currently, I'm not taking anything else, although I do have a cabinet full of all kinds of supplements. A lot of them are contextual uh, or just in case. So I guess in the way that some people have a medicine cabinet, I primarily have like a, if I'm getting sick cabinet, So, uh, those have, you know, things like if I, you know, zinc acetate lozenges, for example, or, um, iodine rinses that I could use if I, if, you know, if I've been around sick people and I feel something coming on and things like that. Um, and then I have a lot of stuff that I have been taking, but I'm not anymore because it's not relevant. So for example, five years ago, I went on a course of an antifungal medication that gave me a very severe twitching problem due to presumably mitochondrial damage that I got from it. And for a couple of years, I was taking beta alanine and vitamin B6 because they were helping with my acid base balance and with preventing the twitching problem. Uh, And I stopped them several times over the course of those several years. And generally, the twitching problem came back within a couple of weeks. And this year it didn't. So I haven't been taking those for uh, pretty much since the beginning of the year. And I think that's just because it took a few years to heal the mitochondrial damage and I don't need them anymore. Uh, so there's been a, you know many, probably many dozens or hundreds of supplements that I have taken in the past. But currently I'm actually right now I'm in the process of 
biochemical optimization through lots and lots of testing. And I'm doing some experiments in what I believe is a mildly biotin deficient state. So the next supplement that I'm going to take is biotin, but I've been conducting experiments on myself in what I think is a mildly biotin deficient state for several months. And I'm going to complete my data collection by what will probably line up at the end of the year. So probably in January, I'll be taking a biotin supplement. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it seems like me and you have a little bit of a different approach in, in this sure. uh, area where I go, uh, you know, balls Kitchen to the sink. wall on, yeah. on that stuff. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's like, I just like, okay, I'm going to throw everything I can at it. And I, I take one thing at a time in kind of like a high dose to see, do I notice what are the physiological effects where it seems like you're approaching these things way more cautiously like before you take any supplement, you're doing, I mean, mountains of research. You're thinking about exactly. Yeah, what I don't. Goes. I don't. I should clarify something. So I, I don't know that that's necessarily true. The reason that I'm taking so long on the on the biotin thing is because I my biotin intake is very high. It's got to be because biotin, the most abundant and reliable sources of biotin are liver and egg yolks, and I'm taking. Uh, I, I go back and forth between either eating like four to eight ounces of liver a week or taking liver supplements when I'm not getting that in my diet. And I, and I religiously eat three to four egg yolks a day. So my biotin intake has to be in the top 95th percentile, but my biotin levels were in the uh, bottom 10th uh, of the range of the normal range, which really makes no sense. And because this is so anomalous, I think I might have struck what is the explanation I've been searching at for the last 20 years, which is why when I went vegan, did I wind up uh, basically going psychotic with severe neurological problems that completely disappeared when I started eating a diet with a lot of organ meats. So I, I've long suspected for 20 years that I have some kind of de genetic defect in uh, recycling or synthesizing something that is not found very abundantly in plant foods was not in the supplements I was taking at the time and is very abundant in organ meats or, if you will, in a diet that rich in liver and egg yolks. And, and because I think that I might have found what might be a, a biotin transporter defect, and, and actually the first, the when I do take this biotin supplement, I actually... I have these lab tests ordered. I just haven't done them yet because I'm trying to collect other data. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and get my biotin tested before and after I, before and one hour after taking a biotin supplement to see what the absorption is. So it's really more that I, because I believe that this might explain the last 40 years of my health history and might be the thing that I've been trying to figure out for the last 20 years that I've kind of stopped everything and decided to take a much more uh, data collection heavy approach than usual because if my hunch is right, then I re I really want to exploit uh, the knowledge that I can gain about this to the maximum. So if you if you caught me la you know a couple of years ago, I probably would have been do doing something somewhat similar to you. Um, you know, so like when I was dealing with the twitching problem the day that I took terbinafin five years ago, that was the antifungal. That's the antifungal. Same day, uh, the you know, I had the worst twitching problem that I ever had in my life. With the large muscles of my thigh were just like. Was that the first and, time you took it? Yeah, it happened. And then, yeah. it, and you stopped taking it, or you continued? No, no, no. I kept taking it because I, I had so the the, <laughs> I was um, at the time I, I was in a, a small Brooklyn apartment and. Because my bedroom window had a fire escape in it, it was illegal to put an air conditioner in there. And so I started sleeping in the living room because the one window that I that it was legal to put an air conditioner in was in my living room. And I didn't have a powerful enough AC system to make that to like make that cool my room. And so because I was sleeping under the air conditioner, it also turned out that I didn't really notice it at the time, but the windowsill was had severely chipping paint. And so I'm, it was blowing paint dust that turned out to be very high in barium, which interferes with potassium handling, um, basically on top of me all night when I slept. But then it also turned out that there was a very severe black mold in the uh, problem in the place. 
And the one of the places that was really severely overloaded with black mold was um, was behind the shower wall, which what happened to be also the other side of that wall was the one that was that I was sleeping under. And so I during this time where I was basically had like severe barium toxicity and mold toxicity, I developed a very bad fungal infection and uh, cute. Like it was, it was like a gref- aggressively like trying to take over all of my skin. And so the terbinafin was the only thing that, that was stopping it from getting worse. And I could see its effect in real time. And in fact, I was actually asking the dermatologist to, to, to give me uh, enough to take two a day and she wouldn't. Um, but, the, but, the, but, the, but well, hold on the point that the point that I wanted to make was when this happened, I just, uh, I was like, well, this is probably an electrolyte issue, which electrolyte works. And so, you know, I just took a bunch of calcium and it didn't do anything. I took a bunch of potassium, uh, sodium and it didn't do anything. I took a bunch of magnesium and it didn't do anything. And then I took a bunch of potassium and it stopped. And so then, you know, I realized within a day or two that the, that I could largely make the twitching problem go away if I got five grams of potassium a day. And that would take care of 80% of it. The other 20% I could get rid of if I cut out acidic foods from my diet. So it was an acid-base issue that was you know, much much worse affecting potassium than any of the other electrolytes. Um, and that, you know, p- because I had like 95% cured it within a day, that's part of the reason that I kept taking it. But um, but my my point is, you know, that's probably more in line with the type of thing that you do now, which is like, hey, I'll try this thing and see what it does. And then, you know, so, buy on yeah, the next thing once you make a conclusion. Interesting enough, uh, biotin is one of the nutrients that can control fungal infections, if my memory serves me correct. But Oh, well, now I believe that I, that I was, uh, that the reason that I was, that I was vulnerable to the fungal infection was because I was biotin deficient. And in fact, one of the key signs of biotin deficiency is conjunctivitis. And it's interesting that around the same time I got, uh, I was in a bar and I had like, uh, I was just drinking one drink standing in a crowd of people and there was some live music and I felt like a piece of dust go into my eye and I woke up with the most severe conjunctivitis where it, I had such so, uh, so much light sensitivity that just to get the phone number of the ophthalmologist was like hell because I was like squinting my eyes, like trying to block the screen light from hurting my eyes while I'm finding the phone number. And then I was like, you know what? This is uh, like, I, I, I probably, um, I was like, what do I have in my cabinet? So I went and I took like 70,000 IU of vitamin A, which, which is also important for controlling fungal infections. By the time I went to the ophthalmologist, it was all gone. Um, and the ophthalmologist was like, there's no way that that was an infection with how fast it went away. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, yeah, sure, <laughs> whatever. But, like, I know how to get rid of an infection, but, uh, but yeah. And, and now that I think about it, you know, because my mind is is going here, I'm I'm realizing that that actually my childhood was completely dominated by conjunctivitis. Like I had a whole protocol. Like if I wake up and I can't open my eyes, I know that there's crust over there, and I know I got to go to the bathroom and put put the warm water with the washcloth on it. And I'm like. And at that point, I'm I'm realizing like, well, wow, I don't think other people like had conjunctivitis as much as I did when I was a kid. But um, you know, people people don't. I wasn't. You know, if you're not if you're not having uh, seizures or something when you're a kid, people don't tend to put those things together for you. So one thing. Um, okay, so I kind of had a, a similar experience where. I kind of, you know, there there was something I felt was missing for a long time, some kind of uh, deficiency, right? Because I felt like there were, like, I, I was able to improve my health in so many ways. It was ridiculous. But there was still, like, I would look around and see, like, some mutants that, you know, they would just never get sick. And I'd be like, why is my body different than these mutants? <laughs> right? Like, uh, why am I not a mutant, right? They could sleep, like, five hours and they feel fine the next morning. Not that they feel necessarily great or whatever, but they feel fine. Like if I slept five hours, I'd be like, that's it. I'm done for the day, right? Call it quits. And so while I was healthy, even you could consider very healthy from a normal standard, there were also other things that were an issue. For example, I had a skin fungus. It wasn't severe, but like a a minor skin fungus, tinea versicolor, which is very common. I think like 10% of the population have it. 
But it's like, why do I have this? And, you know, it's you get idiopathic, right? And nobody really knows why. And I, and I felt like, you know, I just felt like my immune system maybe could have been improved, right? There, there was room to improve on my immune system. And then I decided to go with your approach uh, in the sense of like, I recently I decided to like do a whole bunch of lab tests. I even went to India and took, you know, 200 different kinds of lab tests, checked everything and really like, researched my Are health they cheaper was, in india or is there just stuff you can't get in the united states both now? both way cheaper <laughs> like way cheaper and way more efficient they, they they came to my hotel in the morning like it was a program so i know the guy who's heading the program i'm gonna head a program in uh, early march where you know i take people and they just get everything done all part of the cost so they they came to my room and I have like all these doctors and <laughs> it was just great and i uploaded them to all to self decode which was a game changer. Like literally, I'm, 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 I'm not doing it to plug my, I'm not saying that to plug my own product, but literally when you upload 10 years of all your lab results and you see what is going on and, and I would take a lab result, you know, lab test every year or whatever. And so I was able to see a whole bunch of lab tests, what was happening. And I was doing research and the conclusion of the research was that I was nice and deficient, Right. And I was like, how is this possible that I'm nice and deficient? I'm getting five times the RDA of nice and everything I'm freaking eating has nice. And I just eat meat all day, <laughs> right? I'm like, you know, meat, what, liver, whatever. I'm, I'm eating tons of nice. And also a and ton of your niacin comes from the protein. From tryptophan. Yeah. 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 So I was eating also a lot of tryptophan, which converts. Uh, and I was even, uh, you know, I was, I, I, and, and, and there was also something, there's like a, Basically, I had like 10 different lines of reasoning of why I thought I'm nice and deficient. I could go through that, but I don't want to kind of, you know, uh, clog the podcast with that. But essentially, um, all of the things like that, that, that were kind of like lingering that didn't, I felt like didn't kind of basically like I wasn't at the mutant level that I, I saw other people. And again, what, what does a mutant level mean? You were you exercise for four hours and you're not dead after, right? I feel like uh, like my I'm like very worn out after four hours of exercise, like playing volleyball or something like that, and and, and you know and and so, uh, but and, and I was like, what the hell is going on? And so uh, in my blood test, the niacin was almost at like zero, and I'm literally taking five times. You're talking the about the, the concentration of actual niacin in the blood, like the yeah, the and, and, level. And, I took that test a, a while ago and I, I didn't really trust it because these things fluctuate right in the blood. But that along with 10 other lines of evidence made me think that, that I'm deficient. And then I just took nice and a hundred milligrams and I was like, holy shit. Right. I, I took it at 6 PM and I remember I couldn't go to sleep at four, until 4 AM that night. Cause I was so wired with energy. Right? <laughs> and, and the other thing was, and listen to this, Gets even inch more interesting. I was taking 200 milligrams of NMN, which is a form of B3. And so you would think that if you're taking NMN. Wait, so what was the new supplement? Was it nicotinic acid? Correct. Yeah. Yep. Nicotinic acid. Uh, niacinamide also did the job. Um, in inostyl hexanicinate also does the job. So all the niacins did the job except nicotinamide riboside and NMN, right? I don't know why exactly. Yeah, it was just super that, interesting. That sounds like a digestive issue to me. Uh, Could be. Interestingly, I I have I had a client this this week where um, just looked like straight up like many B vitamin deficiencies based on functional markers. So not not the plasma levels, which this person didn't have measured, but the organic acids that would be lost in the urine if you were deficient in certain B vitamins. So it especially looked like B6 deficiency and uh, a deficiency of what might be um, either thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, lipoic acid, or a combination of them. Uh, some of these enzymes use a bunch of B vitamins, so you can't tell like which is which when you see the organic acids in the urine. And um, this person had taken P5P, which is the activated form of B6, 100 milligrams a day, which is a massive amount relative to what you need. You know, the RDA is for a typical male is around 1.3 milligrams. Uh, 
you might get five or six milligrams in the diet. There's a hundred milligrams is a lot. And the markers didn't go anywhere. Didn't, this person didn't feel anything. And so our, uh, based on some other stuff, uh, my, my suspicion is that this person is not dephosphorylating the B vitamins in the gut, which is necessary for their absorption. So you have nonspecific phosphatases that are part of your digestive enzymes that if you take NMN, will break it down to nicotinamide riboside, which has no phosphate. Um, and it could, could generally things with, there are some exceptions to this, but the general rule of thumb is that things with ionic charges and phosphate has a negative charge can't cross the intestines basically. So you dephosphorylate everything. With the, in the case of NMN, that would be dephosphorylating it to nicotinamide riboside, although you know that can be further broken down to, to, to niacinamide as well. Um, and no one really knows like how much is broken down, how much in the typical digestive process. But with him, uh, we're you know I, I want to see if pyridoxine will help normalize those markers and help the person feel better because the problem might be uh, uh, breaking down the phosphate from the more complex forms of the B vitamins in the gut. So food doesn't really do anything and the, and the good supplements don't really do anything, but the cheap crap might be the thing that works. I, um, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if, if it's something similar in your case. Yeah. I, I mean, something that might be against that is I did a mega dose of experiment with NMN. So I took about 800 milligrams and there was a very distinct effect. I could feel that, it was being absorbed. Whereas I feel like if if it wasn't being absorbed in the gut, then uh, I, I you know I don't know if taking a mega dose would kind of solve that problem necessarily. Well, I mean, it would. It, the, would it would if the gut absorption was impaired by you know ninety percent. I mean the, the the and also almost everything has some degree of passive absorption in the gut. So if you take the, the take the case of pernicious anemia which is uh, an impairment in absorbing vitamin B12. In that case, what you generally do is you might be eating uh, one, two, three micrograms of B12 in your diet, and you have something produced by the, uh, by the stomach uh, called intrinsic factor, and there's, there's a variety of things that happen between the stomach and the small intestines to actively absorb most of that B12 because your goal is to basically get one to three micrograms per day. And uh, if you have an impairment in that absorption, uh, you'll get pernicious anemia. So you eat all the B12 you want and it doesn't get absorbed. However, although they typically treat B12, uh, pernicious anemia with B12 shots, you can simply take 2,000 to 3,000 micrograms orally and it will cure almost anyone with pernicious anemia because you get 0.1% passive absorption of the dose, which means that it's, you know, it's not part of the active process. It's just that a high enough amount of anything is going to slip between the intestinal cells, basically. Um, you know, so I, I don't know that you can rule that out. I mean, the point is that a hundred milligrams of, of nicotinic acid did something that 800 milligrams of NMN had more difficulty doing. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I would think you, you would also have to have some type of something interfering. Have you looked at your plasma levels of tryptophan? Uh, no. Because I would think you would have to have so, also have some kind of uh, impairment in synthesis of, of niacin in order to be so dependent on any form of dietary niacin, you know, because in a typical person, it's very hard. Like if you look at the pellagra epidemics that occurred back, you know, back in the day when we, when we were first discovering the vitamins, those didn't just happen because of niacin deficiency. They happened on the background of severely protein deficient diets. So what happened was the Western Europeans took corn from the Mesoamericans and didn't take the the, the traditional process of nixtamalizing it in order to digest it with an alkaline soak to release the niacin. But it was also when they were just eating corn, like largely corn-based diets, they weren't getting any protein. Um, you know, so if you're eating a lot of meat, you, sh you should be synthesizing your own niacin. So I think you have to have kind of like a double hit of something in order to be kind of dependent on taking nicotinic acid in order to get normal niacin status. So one of the interesting things with niacin, uh, you know, basically there, there was two thing, there, there was one thing that I always felt was the best for reducing my food sensitivities. And that was butyrate, mainly in the form of resistant starch. 
And so uh, when I consumed a resistant starch that didn't have like lectins, it, it is something that I sell, Joe's resistant starch, whatever. But it, butyrate, however you're getting it, basically uh, was really good for my food sensitivities. And there's studies to show that for allergies, food sensitivity, things like that, there's uh, butyrate is very good. And then what I found was niacin was also very good. And I realized that there's the niacin receptor that both butyrate and niacin hits. And I feel like that was also a, you know, pharmacological effect. Uh, so there was kind of like all these things uh, that came together. Another interesting thing was Bell's palsy. Nobody, they say that's, that it's idiopathic. And I had it when I was 13. And then I just found a study where like, from 1950s where there was like 76 people who took niacin uh and they all got better like from bell's palsy pretty quickly and i was just like it, it just was, it was like wow that this makes so much sense because even after some like sometimes only when i started this meat diet and got much more niacin did i you know because sometimes it would be like a little bit of a reactivation but did that go away so it was just kind of like all these things coming together also the the skin issues went away all the all the skin issues and um it turns out that niacin has, you know, uh, antifungal effects and, and it, it, immune boosting effects as well in certain ways. So all that was uh, really interesting. And, and so I kind of stopped believing in the whole RDA thing. It, it's just, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's just like I was, I was a big believer that like, okay, 98% of people RDA. And then <laughs> based on my own experience, I guess it's clouded by that. I'm just like, all these nutrients that I feel like I'm doing much better when I'm getting more than the RDA, it's like, what the hell is going on here? You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah. I mean, the RDA is – the theory behind the RDA is that it is adequate for 97.5% of people and inadequate for 2.5% of people. That's the entire point of the RDA. Um, so – you know, the RDA itself predicts that 2.5% of people will have a deficiency, a clinical deficiency on the RDA. So yeah, but th that's healthy people, but every, but now everybody's got some kind of problem too. Uh, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's assuming that there's a distribution of health and disease in the population and that 97.5% of people are going to, are going to fall within that without respect to their health. I mean, I, I do think that there's a lot of problems with how the RDAs were designed, and a lot of it depends on who was running the committees. So if, if you look at the RDAs for the – the majority of current RDAs were done um, all at a very specific uh, period of time, some 20-ish uh, to 30-ish years ago. And there have been some recent ones. So for example, the potassium and, and sodium were just updated in 2019. And then 2010, the calcium and vitamin D were updated. But most of them are from before that period of time. And you can see how who's in charge of the committee is, is determining um, how they make them, right? So like currently, evidence-based medicine is the uh the trending kind of approach and so what they did with the most recent potassium studies is they is, uh potassium rda or there is no rda for the potassium they set an ai which is what they have when they don't have enough evidence but they they basically reinterpreted all the old evidence where in 2005 they had set the ai for potassium at um uh 4.7 grams a day on the basis that there were some people who were salt who had salt sensitive hypertension who needed 4.7 grams a day to be able to tolerate salt without a rise in blood pressure and here they they didn't have any new studies on this but they said salt sensitive hypertension is not a is not a highly uh it's not a highly specific diagnosis and a decrease in blood pressure is not a is not a clinical finding. A decrease in the incidence of hypertension is a clinical finding. So they went back to all the old studies on potassium that had all shown that it decreases your blood pressure. And they said that because none of these diagnosed the people with hypertension and none of them looked at the threshold of who was hypertensive, 
showing a decrease in blood pressure is just physiological. It's not clinical. And so, so none of these were clinical studies. And so they threw out the entire batch of potassium studies showing a decrease in blood pressure because it wasn't a clinical finding. And that was influenced by, by the modern evidence-based medicine pyramid. But if you go back to the... So what is it now? What is the RD... Like... AI. Oh, they de- it depends whether you're a man or a woman, but it's basically like 2.3 to 3 grams. So they, they massively oh, wow. reduced it. There was wow. no change in any evidence whatsoever. <laughs> they just used a new type of framework for interpreting it. If you go back to the to where most of the RDAs are from, the the person who was the uh, in charge of the whole operation, so it's the Food and Nutrition Board which is a subpart of what was the Institute of Medicine and is now called the National Academy of Medicine. And I forget whether the guy was the head of the FNB or was higher than that, but um, I'd have to go back into my notes. But he was very concerned that if they set the RDAs too high, they would be creating uh, an epidemic of nutrient toxicity because everyone would be on supplements because no one's diet would be adequate. And, and, the influence of that also is that whenever they look at the population, they say, what are the nutrients of concern? The methodology that is universally used in the literature is not to use the RDA, but to use the estimated average requirement. So I should, I should back up a second. So when they make an RDA, they first estimate the average requirement. Uh, so you know, 100, 100 people, the 50th percentile, like 50% of people will have a higher requirement than the average, 50% will have a lower requirement than the average. So they estimate the average. Then they say, what's the very, what's the distribution of variation in the requirement for this nutrient? So do, you know, if you take a hundred people, do two of those people need 10 X the average, or do they need 10% more than the average? And so then they take two standard deviations of the variation for that up and down, and they say the they set the RDA at where it will cover the needs of ninety seven point five percent of the of the population. So um, there's there's two points to this. Uh, one is every paper where they go out and they say what's what's the magnesium status of the American population? Is it a nutrient of concern or not? They don't look at the RDA, which covers ninety seven point five percent of the of the population. They look at the EAR, the estimated average requirement, which is only designed to cover fifty percent of the needs of the population. And they say if the mean intake of the population falls below the EAR, the average requirement, then we have a problem. If the mean intake falls above the EAR, we don't have a problem. And this is pseudo mathematics, okay? So because if if the average requirement for something is being met by the mean intake, that means that 50% of people are consuming more than the average and 50% of people are consuming less than the average. The only way we don't have a problem is if the all the 50% of people who are consuming less than the average are the same people whose personal individual requirement is less than the average. But why on earth would you assume that, right? right. So the the RDA really should cover 97.5% of the population. And you would want the population consuming the RDA to feel confident that only 2.5% of the people are deficient. And they never do that. Why? Because, because when policy was set in place, the concern was if we tell everyone that the mean intake of the population is a concern for all the nutrients, everyone's going to go to GNC or Walmart or whatever, and they're going to be buying boatloads of nutritional supplements or cabinets are going to look like yours and mine. And then we're going <laughs> to, then our problem's going to be everyone has vitamin A toxicity or niacin toxicity or whatever. And so, and so as a result of that, if you go back and look at how the RDAs were calculated, the key missing piece of evidence is what is the variation in the requirement? So in almost every case, they did not have any data on what the variation in the requirement was. So what did they assume? That one standard deviation is 10%. So almost every RDA is the EAR times 1.2 because they just assume that, the vari- that a standard deviation is 10% of the average. The problem is Every single case where they had evidence about what the variation in the requirement was, it was way higher than 10%. So in the case of niacin, they had four studies that looked at the variation in the requirement, and they all showed that the standard deviation in the variation 
of the requirement was somewhere around 30 to 40%. And so that means you would have to multiply the niacin, uh, the average requirement, you would have to multiply it by like 80%, like 1.8 to include the 40% of people who are one standard deviation and then the next 40% of people who require even more than that in order to cover 97.5% of the people. So what did they do? They said, they said, huh, um, it's clear from these studies that the that a standard deviation in the variation of the requirement is more than 10%, which is what we usually use. But we don't know what it really is. So we're going to say it's 15%. All right. So so all the evidence showed that it was like 30 to 40%. And they said, well, that's clearly more than 10. So let's do 15. And so the, the niacin requirement would be almost twice as high if they if they actually followed like what their protocol is supposed to be to make it. And so that's that's part of the problem there. This whole RDA nonsense is not showing what's optimal. It's just basically like let's say if I have more anxiety that I don't have more methylfolate. And and that's true. I'll get more anxiety. I won't get an anxiety condition per se, right? I won't be diagnosed by a psychologist. I'll just have more anxiety in the day. Are they going to say, oh, you have a little more anxiety in the day now? Your your need for methylfolate is higher? No, because you weren't diagnosed with a condition as a result of being on this level of folate. Is that true or not? That's that's true, and I think the the wildest example of this is the recent uh, RDA, or it's, they don't have an RDA for either sodium or potassium, but the the recent uh, so the RDAs and the and all the other numbers they come up with are called the DRIs, the dietary reference intakes. So the recent DRIs for sodium and potassium from 2019, the funniest example is the sodium, where they set the adequate intake. Um, they said they said the mean. In, usually what they do with the adequate intake is is they say, we don't have enough evidence for an RDA. So let's take the mean of the population of, of apparently healthy people. And let's just say that's adequate. So for sodium, they said uh, the mean um, the mean sodium intake of the population of apparently healthy people is apparently not healthy. So we're going to take the mean sodium intake of the DART trial where they... Uh, reduced, where it was a sodium reduction trial. So they set the adequate intake at the mean intake of the DART trial because they said that like it didn't appear to cause um, <laughs> sodium deficiency, but it, it actually caused a bunch of like fatigue and 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 other things um, in that trial. Like fifteen percent of the people had had like meaningful side effects of the sodium reduction. Right. So that's not and the funny part. They're not going to tell wait, you. Wait, wait, oh, that's that's not the funny part. The funny part is they said that. These this adequate intake does not uh, apply to people who sweat a lot, and they they <laughs> never defined what sweating a lot was. <laughs> okay, that's hilarious. Basically, it's like you, you let's say I enroll in one of these RDA studies. They put me on this nutrient. I got brain fog. I've got more anxiety. I got like, a whole bunch of more of issues, but I don't have any diagnosed disorder or anything like that. Like, oh, it looks like you've uh, met your nutrient requirements right here. And yeah, well, uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead. No. I, well, I do I, think there's something to the in, in the sense that oh, having too much of certain nutrients can be bad, right? We know that. So it's not saying that you know the RDAs are nonsense. Just go with every nutrient you can find and take <laughs> like five times the dosage or whatever, right? That's not necessarily the right approach. I'll give you an example why. I took a blood test and my chromium and selenium were higher. Why exactly? Probably because I was taking a lot of nutritional yeast. But the the point is, is that, and 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 there's negative of of having higher levels of selenium. There's there's benefits. Oh yeah. And there's negatives, right? Um. So it's well, like there's negative. there's a sweet spot for selenium, and it's pretty narrow where where your diabetes risk starts going up after the kind of like the exactly sweet spot to lower cancer. Yeah. So type two diabetes. So the point is, is but the question is number one is. What are you concerned about? So if you're concerned, if you check your HbA1c and you're pre-diabetic, then you should be more concerned with diabetes. This is like what is a much more nuanced approach. I'll give you another example. So like folate, methylfolate, and vitamin B12. Vitamin B12, uh, people who have higher levels, uh, and, and also some, I think there were some clinical trials, higher risk of lung cancer and colorectal cancer. That's, that's what 
studies have found. I don't know if that's a hundred percent fact, but it is well, a potential let me, risk. Let me say that once you have cancer, uh, most nutrients are going to promote cancer progression. Right. So that's a great point. So we don't know if that that what these studies were finding were people who already have cancer and then it basically grew quicker. But I guess you still want to like if you're someone that is more susceptible to cancer, you have a parent or grandparent that who had lung cancer, or colorectal cancer. I think that is going to play a more prominent role in how you think about whether you want to take B12. Yeah, I don't I don't know I don't know about that. I mean, I, I agree with the general principle, but I I think the line for cancer is really whether when you're diagnosed with it because most things that uh that promote cancer progression are essential at the doses that will promote cancer progression and actually are are cancer preventative. So, as you know, to take niacin as an example, uh, most cancers require niacin for growth in some form and some cancers will will preferentially feed off nicotinamide riboside versus nicotinic acid uh, because they have different pathways of uh, synthesizing or accumulating niacin that are activated. Uh, but niacin is uh, is genoprotective. You know, so one of the one of the main things that depletes your niacin levels from any illness or disease state is, and this this is why uh, niacin deficiency generally causes a sun sensitive skin problem, because every time you damage your DNA, you use niacin up to repair it. And in the in the case of sun, all of us who are not niacin deficient, every time we go out in the sun to any amount, are getting some DNA damage that is that is hydrolyzing niacin to repair the DNA. And the reason we don't have dermatitis as a result is because we have enough niacin to do that. You know, so if you if you try to restrict niacin on the basis that you have a family history of cancer when you don't have cancer, you're probably going to wind up with cancer as a result of it because you're going to compromise your genoprotection. Um, this is very similar with protein intake. Like protein intake will fuel cancer growth when you have it, but if you restrict your protein to a low intake because you have a family history of cancer when you're young, you're gonna you're gonna compromise your glutathione status, which is going to be a major driver of protecting. Uh, of de detoxifying carcinogens. So I really think the dividing line with cancer is, I know that there's obviously a pre-diagnosis phase where you have the cancer and you're promoting the growth. The problem is like probability wise, uh, there is, there, there's no other cutoff to use that isn't going to do more harm than good by, you know, if you, if you don't like age, for example, like age and family history is not good enough to bias the probability in favor of restricting nutrients to deficiency levels to prevent cancer growth. Um, so that's, that's my take. So on that. I would agree with that completely. And, and, and I, I, I agree with your whole philosophy as well. I have the same, I I've from all the reading I've done, I've seen the same thing that once you have cancer, it's a, a completely different beast than when you don't have cancer, right? It's just that you're doing a lot of opposite stuff, right? Maybe a, a vegan diet could be good if you, I don't, I, I don't know what a uh, cancer protocol is, but I know that it's very, very different because cancer basically just hijacks everything. Uh, if I had grow. cancer, I would consider a vegan diet, even though veganism nearly killed my brain when I was younger, <laughs> right. but I would, I, I am not saying right. I would go vegan. Cause it's so deficient I, on so many nutrients, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm not saying I would go vegan if I had cancer, but I, you know, I right. would be doing a lot of research and a, and a vegan diet would be on my list as, uh, as something that I might consider using. Um, because, because I do think, you know, can't, a lot of people are interested in like, fat versus carbs for cancer. And I, I think it, it really misses the point, which is that uh, fat and carbs can equally be used for energy. And I know that there is a lot of research on how cancer cells have their fat oxidation compromised, but there are also heterogeneous populations of cancer cells where uh, if the majority are uh, carbohydrate dominant, there are some hiding there that are fat dominant. And uh, Daryl Edwards was a big proponent of the ketogenic diet for his sister, um, and she got she had cancer and she got better on the ketogenic diet, and then all of a sudden she got tremendously worse and she died. And that doesn't mean that the ketogenic diet killed her, but but he, you know he was he felt guilty about 
do about putting her on on the diet that he thought would help her at, when she still died. And so he did a lot of research into this, and now he basically is like has been presenting about this for for uh, the last several years, which is basically that there are cancer cells that that can burn fat for energy. But the thing is that all any cell needs protein to grow because protein provides basic amino acid building blocks that uh, you can't make proteins without protein, right? So it, it protein is is really sort of like the universal restrictor has protein deficiency will compromise the growth of any cell. So I do think because you you can't make um, proteins out of anything else except amino acids. You can you can go on a low carb diet, and if you're meeting your caloric needs, your cancer cells can burn fat, or you, you, your cancer cells can burn carbs. Um, even if they're compromised, you know th- it's not like there's no cancer cells that can't burn any any fat. And you might cause selective pressure to make a fat burning cancer in that case, but you can't cause selective pressure to make a cancer that can engage in a massive amount of, of protein synthesis to make new cells when there's not enough protein available for that. So I think some of these nutrients that are just involved and folate is, is another one that's just, just straight up needed for DNA synthesis. Like you can't duplicate cells if you don't have enough folate period, end of story. Um, and so I, I think if you have cancer, you, you, you pro- probably the ideal um, diet is going to be something that restricts the things that are absolutely critical to the growth of any cell, and that will, you know, probably come at the at uh, at, at, at the risk of, um, you know, compromising compromising the growth of your own cells. But when when your priority is responding best to the to the to the cancer treatment, that's probably going to be what helps. And a vegan diet is generally going to be very low in protein, very high in folate. So, you know, it's, I would probably be doing some kind of modified low protein diet that isn't entirely vegan because I would be wanting to, you know, get my nutrient bases on other things. But all of this requires research, of course. Like there's there, we, there's just no randomized controlled trials of all these different dietary permutations for, for the prognosis of cancer, but we need them. Right, for sure. And one thing you mentioned before, just to uh, go back to the RDA stuff, one possibility of why I'm deficient in, in niacin is because I get a lot of sun. My vitamin D without taking vitamin D is yeah. uh, 61 nanograms per deciliter. Yep. And that's without any vitamin D whatsoever, right? It's just from sun. So I get a lot of sun. And like you said, sun is going to use up niacin and, and yep. a bunch of maybe other things I do use up niacin. But are they doing uh, these studies in, in, in New York, right? <laughs> like uh-huh. Minnesota, right? <laughs> like... Where it's just, I, I think the, the takeaway is that there's so many permutations and combinations, and uh, they're really only looking at uh, if you're getting some kind of noticeable disease over a short period of time, rather than are you optimally healthy. Well, I think that they're. I think the RDA, the DRIs, which is the g- sort of generic term for the RDA and everything related to it. I think they over time have generally reflected what, whatever the state of the science was. And it's long been a criticism of them that they were focused on deficiency diseases rather than um, rather than health. But even if you go back to like the 90s and 2000s, their, their metrics really had evolved a lot from deficiency science towards biochemical optimization. And so if you look at the RDA for vitamin C, for example, that's set on what is the largest um what is the largest amount of vitamin c that you can get that will increase the vitamin c in your lymphocytes and help them uh ex vivo fight off pathogens without getting a disproportionate loss of the vitamin c in your urine so it it really is kind of a a proxy to try to understand what would best support immune function and yeah, that, but you don't that's know because all the other all the other things vitamin C is doing that they're not checking for. Well, they you know they they also cross referenced it with like ep- epidemiological studies on the plasma levels that are associated with reduced risk of heart disease and cancer and so on. But I mean, oh, okay. my my point is that the vitamin C requirement has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with scurvy, and is set based on what they had available to them at the time that would that would lead to the most efficient reduction of the chronic disease burden. And this is 20 or 30 years ago. So, you know, the criticism that the RDAs are, are based on 
deficiency, like clinical deficiency is sort of like a relic of a way earlier time of the RDAs going back way before the eighties and nineties. Um, and you know, and if you, you think look that at, was a good approach. I think there, I mean, there's plenty you can criticize about them, but I, I mean, I think it's better than setting the RDA to prevent scurvy, um, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and I don't think, I, I think that the, the RDA, if I were to set, well, my vitamin C target is higher than the RDA, but, um, but the, you know, there's, there's not a lot of good evidence for setting it way higher than it is. And, uh, if you, if you look at like, um, immune function, right? So basically the, the current RDA for vitamin C is basically set based on immune function. The only data that really support a, a higher level of vitamin C is in people who are undergoing a massive amount of extraneous stress. So like the clinical trials, uh, if you just look at meta-analysis for vitamin C in the common cold, what you'll find is that all the trials that were done in normies found no benefit of vitamin C ab- over and above the, the basic intake. And the the trials that sh- that as a category, consistently show a prophylactic effect of vitamin C supplementation, reducing the incidence of colds are people who are doing things like, um, like, like military, uh, prep procedures in the Arctic and stuff like that. So it's, it's like people who were doing, um, or marath- marathon runners and skiers also, it's, it was like people who are, um, engaging in a way above average kind of like elite athlete level, uh, degree of strenuous, physical activity under extreme conditions is basically the people who would benefit from more vitamin C. And the, those trials use doses between 250 milligrams a day and 2000 milligrams a day. None of them compared doses head to head. And the lower doses didn't show any inferior benefit than the higher doses. So really what that says is like you prob- the average person for immunity probably needs the RDA for vitamin C or thereabouts. But a lot of people who are under more stress could probably use something closer to 250 milligrams. Um, you know, but even if you go up to like my my range is kind of like you want at least 150 milligrams, you could go up to like 400. Because if you look at the studies on how much vitamin C can you uh, can you supplement with to actually get more vitamin C in your system, you really can't get more vitamin C in your system higher than taking 200 milligrams twice a day, which is like a 400 milligram average across the day. And when you do take higher than higher doses than that, you basically don't get any high, any higher plasma levels of vitamin C. You don't get any cellular levels of vitamin C increasing. You just wind up with a bunch of oxalate in your urine. Um, and so I'm not saying that there's no merit to higher doses of vitamin C, but the, but the, the, wherever the merit is, is, is not the, it's not within the sort of normal distribution of concern for the average person. It's, it's a, even, even like with COVID, like the, uh, even in the ICU, um, there, there's two trials that were double blind randomized controlled trials in ICU patients with COVID that found a benefit of vitamin C supplementation. One was high dose intravenous vitamin C with many grams a day. And the other one was 500 milligrams of vitamin C orally. And they both gave similar results Right, so what what that means is like even the ICU even the ICU COVID patient, maybe they're going to benefit from six grams a day of IV vitamin C, but probably actually they just need five hundred milligrams. The only the only place where it's very clearly indicated that you would want high dose in, intravenous vitamin C is in sepsis patients, where they they literally need high dose intravenous vitamin C to get their plasma levels into the normal range. You know, so the, these are people who are just consuming massive amounts of vitamin C. But that, like, if you look at the distribution of requirements, most people are pretty close to the RDA and the edge cases where you want to be really far from the RDA is, is basically limited to sepsis. I just want to interject here that all the nutrients that we were talking about and way more, including everything from all the B vitamins Vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K, selenium, chromium, copper, choline, carnitine, thymine, niacin, biotin, iodine, riboflavin, folate, zinc, vitamin K. All that stuff is in Self-Decode where you can look at your predispositions. So it's very important to look at your predispositions to see what are you more likely to be deficient in. And then you can look at your lab tests to see what are you actually deficient in. 
in my case, they lined up pretty, pretty good. So I found that I was deficient in vitamin K, zinc, folate, riboflavin, and iodine. And those were all accurate. So for me, it, it self-decode said that I needed more zinc. And when I looked at my blood test, I was extremely deficient in zinc, even though I was eating all animal food-based diets. So I was eating as much zinc as you can get in a diet, and I was still deficient in zinc. And uh, I was also eating a fair bit of vegetables. And uh, again, so you really have to look at your genetics because these RDAs, the, the recommended daily allowances, they're not relevant for a lot of people. There's going to be a couple nutrients that you just need more of. And some that you might even need less of. There are certain nutrients that I was never deficient in or even close to being deficient in. An example of that is vitamin A or vitamin B6 or uh, selenium or chromium. And, you know, Self-Decode said that I, I didn't need extra of these nutrients. And when I tested them, actually, I had higher levels of selenium and chromium. And so I really recommend checking out Self-Decode at selfdecode.com and uh, getting uh, a plan where you can look at all your uh, genetic predispositions, including many, many other things that is included. We have 250 reports, a whole lab analyzer, symptom analyzer. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a massive platform. Uh, I think you really love it. There's some clinical trials that show various benefits to taking a little bit more vitamin. Let me, let me try to, to sort of like bullet point just my perspective on that point. I think that the RDA has been you know, moving like a, like a slug over the last century towards setting things for optimal health. Um, but despite the fact that they've been moving in that direction, they do move at the pace of a slug. And you and I, in our analysis of the literature are going to find a lot of nuances and a lot of reasons why a lot of people would want to go above the RDA in certain situations to get to optimal health because we can move faster than they can. So with that said, why are you in, 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 you know, I guess you could say in some way uh, frugal or like with the supplements that you take, why don't you just take a B complex, for example? (laughs) Well, because I mean, look, there's, if you want to, one of the, one of the issues that you have with throwing the kitchen sink at stuff, there's a trade off, right? So the, the, the benefit is that you get better faster, presumably. I mean, you can also hurt yourself faster, but you can get better faster. Um, and the, the downside risk is that you don't have good information on what helped. And the reason that's a, a fairly significant downside risk is that everyone second guesses what they're doing a few months after they start doing it. So they either second guess it because they think it's not working and they're not feeling better or they second guess it because they are feeling better and they don't see the point of doing what they're doing. They're like, I don't have a problem anymore. Why should I keep taking this thing? And so that happened to me so many times. <laughs> exactly. Because you always do the kitchen. It's like that stuff, right? So, so if, if you have super high quality information about what is causing what, then when you start second guessing yourself, you can look at the paperwork and you can say, ah, I know this does this. I know what's necessary. And so I think there's basically two ways to go about that. One is that it, it depends how desperate you are for relief, right? So, so, so for someone who is desperate for relief from a problem, then probably the best thing for them to do is throw the kitchen sink at it. And then when they're feeling better, they can start testing one at a time removal of things in order to, to get, gain high quality information about what they can remove while still retaining the benefit that they got. Someone who's in another situation where they're not desperate for, for fast relief might be better suited to get the high quality information first, you know, collect a, a lot of baseline what, data, add something, see what it does and, and, and move from there. So I'll tell you what I do, uh, like the approach that, that I found works for me. One is, and, and again, I'm not necessarily recommending this to other people, but mega dosing and that I can tell from a subjective effect. And I'm not taking a blood test every day. So what I do is I do a bunch of mega dosing experiments, usually one or two a day. Uh, And I I will look at what the acute effects are and see like, okay, do I have more energy? How is my mood? I basically have like a list of things that I care about. And then I try to take lab tests as often as I can uh, in order to see, okay, I'm on this regimen and and I'm also on like somewhat of a steady regimen. 
it, how is this regimen doing overall for all of my lab tests? And I could see what's going in the right direction or what do I need to add? So that's kind of um, how I do. What do you think is a, a problem with that approach? Uh, I don't think know. it's necessarily a problem, but it, it reminds me of Facebook's growth strategy, move fast and break things. <laughs> and it's uh, it it basically just strikes me as as sort of like, um, you know, like if you were a startup and you had like this big influx of venture <laughs> capital, you would just like start a thousand projects and then use an AI machine to try to figure out, like just analyze this massive amount of data and then come to some conclusion, like vary it. And I guess you know if you look at Facebook, the problem is they have a lot of legacy code. So they have like, they, they made all this code to like build one thing and then they were like, no, let's do this instead. And so they have, they have like all, all the, the, all the glitches. They have to ha like hire staff that are just there to be like, uh, this, this old code for this thing we're no longer using, but we, we, we like repositioned it into this other thing. Like, can we remove this? Cause it's causing a glitch or is the whole system going to fall, fall apart? And I'm not, I'm not trying to, I realize there's limits to any analogy, but I, I think it's, I think your approach is is a little bit like that in the sense that, um, you know, you you will get results. You 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 may well um, get to your optimal state faster because you're not taking as much time to piece together things, and so you're just sort of like throwing the kitchen sink at some something in there is going to work, and then you can tweak it over time in, in the direction. The, I think the issue is like you never really know what the um, what individual components are doing, and um, I, I to take it back to your original story, I still I think you have equally plausible benefits that with niacin you are curing a deficiency and you are getting a farm a normal pharmacological effect, and I actually think your evidence indicates that you're doing both, but the megadosing approach masks the distinction between the two, right? So I know that you were getting a normal pharmacological effect by lowering the phosphorus levels in your blood because you found evidence that that pharmacological effect is is normal and exists in non-niacin deficient people, but you also have gut issues and skin issues and low plasma niacin which are two Ds of the three Ds of pellagra. The, the, there are three or four Ds depending on, on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. The, the three Ds are dementia, dermatitis, uh, and diarrhea. And the fourth D is, if you're a pessimist, is death. And those are like, uh, that's a mnemonic device, right? So dementia doesn't mean like age-related senility. It means depression in in a in a uh in a but i had that as well in the past i oh I, so and, look and I, listen so yeah. you so you you straight up have the pathognomonic uh uh constellation of pellagra deficiency diseases um that's the three d's right so so the, the when when niacin deficiency is is moderate it causes depression and severe it causes schizophrenia and that is condensed into dementia because it starts with D. Um, because they, I mean, de depression doesn't include schizophrenia, right? So they took dementia to start with D. Diarrhea, what it really means is you have malabsorption as a result from villus atrophy that looks very similar to celiac disease because you don't have enough energy to have the, the gut cells, the gut cells have to turn over every three to four days in order to keep the absorptive surface high, right? And so diarrhea can be part of it, but you would also expect if you have poor absorption of nutrients that have food sensitivities. So it's, it's really like diarrhea just happens to start with D. Um, and so it, you know, it's, it's the second D and the dermatitis is, it is a dermatitis, but it's, um, but there's, a, you know, dermatitis can mean a billion different things. And it's, it, it, the telltale signs of, of uh, niacin deficiency dermatitis are that it gets worse in the sun, um, but more importantly, that it goes away when you take niacin. So the, like the, 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 the real telltale thing that anything is caused by niacin deficiency is that niacin makes it go away. And in fact, there's a lot of people with schizophrenia where you just feed them like a high quality meal and all of a sudden it disappears because there was enough niacin in the meal to make it go away and they were just profoundly deficient with the dietary intake, which you weren't. Um, but you know, the problem with just throwing a megadose in and seeing if it feels better is, um, 
we it still seems like awfully suspicious that you probably are without niacin supplementation actually deficient rather than just someone who would benefit from a pharmacological dose of niacin we don't know that and i think it would i think it would help to know things like that and maybe it won't help now because there's no harm in taking 100 milligrams of niacin and it's just part of your protocol but there could be many other examples where you where you would want to know um, I'm not saying your approach is wrong. I'm just saying that the trade-off is that there are some some of these more granular pieces of information you're not going to capture because it's 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 hard now to go back to a previous state of niacin deficiency and then and then see what just taking enough niacin to bring your plasma into the normal range does. So you're probably not ever going to do that unless you get you know just so hungry for that information that you're willing to put yourself through that. Whereas you could have collected that information kind of fast if you were like, well, let me see what dose of niacin. So what I'm going to do, for example, is I'm if my biotin is 10% of the normal range when I'm eating in the 95th percentile biotin intake, the real question to me is, is... I've ruled out biotinidase deficiency, which is a deficiency in the enzymatic recycling. So if I'm right that there is a defect underlying here, it might be a lot scarier than it sounds because it might be a biotin transporter defect. And if it's a biotin transporter defect, then that means that the 10%, the 10th, uh, the bottom 10% of the, of the reference range might be grossly overestimating the biotin status of my cells. Because if the transporter defect is compromising it going from my gut into my plasma, then that means the biotin that the transporter defect is also compromising it from going from the plasma into my cells. So that means that my cells might be in the bottom one percent of the of the biotin range, and then that's enough because of everything else that I know. I'm able to handle my health being quite well in that case, um, you know, but. But that's if if that if something like that is going on, I want to know about it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to test my absorption of 100 uh, micrograms of biotin. And if it's normal, uh, I'll go back to the drawing board trying to figure out what what you know what the problem is. But I'll just start supplementing with biotin. But if it's if it is deficient, then I I want to see what dose of biotin do I need to just bring myself up to normal. Part of the problem is that I'm not super convinced about this, but there is an argument in the literature that there's a pharmacological effect of high-dose biotin. I mean, apart from the fact that high-dose biotin can throw off all your labs uh, and give you false results on like dozens of different labs, I don't just want to keep it under what's going to throw off all my labs. I also want to want to keep it under what might have some pharmacological effect because I want to see what does the nutritional effect do because I want to know if I'm really missing the nutritional effect if I as I think I am. But I want I also want to reiterate that I wouldn't be spending months on this if I didn't think that this was the uh the sort of holy grail of what I've been trying to figure out for 20 years. So you know that's the that's the only reason that I'm spending months instead of weeks on this. Right. So I think to sum up what uh, the approaches are, it's you're treating this more like a scientist. <laughs> you're like, I want to figure out. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I'm treating oh, this yeah. more like yeah. a biohacker. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, all yeah, right. Yeah. That's fair. That's it. Like an entrepreneur. I'm going at it the entrepreneurial route. You're going at it the uh, scientist route. I, I 100% agree with that. Um, and then I would add to that that what most of the stuff that I'm doing now is not about going slow with the biotin. It's about studying what ha- what is happening to me in the biotin deficient state. So my hypothesis has been that if I'm biotin deficient enough on a cellular level, I should be able to show that carbs increase my ketones. And so I've I I did I spent weeks doing a randomized controlled trial on myself, showing that if I fast till 4 p.m. and then I eat 30 grams of carbs from rice, that my ketones go up after that. Whereas if I don't eat the rice, they don't go up. And now I'm trying to look at um, another thing should be like in a normal person, protein intake does not affect glucose tolerance, co-ingestion of protein. So if you give 75 grams of glucose and you give 40 grams of whey protein, you get the same glucose curve as you if you just take 75 grams of glucose with no protein. I, in a biotin deficient state, I believe that that protein would protect you from the glucose intolerance induced by the biotin deficiency. So I'm doing a randomized controlled trial of myself taking dextrose powder with or without whey protein. 
and it takes a while to figure out like what what the right dose and stuff like that is and so i'm i'm approaching this more as a even more as a scientist a science experiment than I had initially let on. And that's, that's the main reason that it's taking a while is because, but li listen to this. If I do randomized control trials on myself, those can, I, you know, it, it's, it doesn't prove anything about what happens outside of myself, but it allows me to study things that are, um, that, that would take like years or decades to sort of mobilize the amount of money funding into a university to fund a study to see whether it does that in 12 people instead of in me, right? Whereas I can just choose to do this right now. So I think to the to the community, to the biohacking community, I think it's super useful to know that you know it matters to your glucose tolerance whether you eat protein when your biotin is in the you know X percent of the normal range. Like why wouldn't you as a biohacker want to know about that? And that's that's something that I think would be even useful for you to know, even if your biotin is not at that level and it's not an issue for you. Um, that's you know something useful to know when analyzing a ton a ton of lab data that like biotin once it falls to this level will alter your glucose handling in this and in this and that way. You know, I want to go back to biotin just for a second because I don't I don't buy this pharmacological thing. So um, the issue is that if you take someone... So first of all, I want, I, I want to make a couple points. So one point would be that even if you have a, like a, a very broad-based platform for looking for lots of SNPs, there, that's never going to be fully adequate for finding any kind of rare defect in a transporter or something like that because there are, you know, like if you take like the inborn errors of metabolism that cause childhood seizures and stuff like that, uh, like 50% of them are, are so-called private mutations, which means that the mutation just arose in that person's family. And so it was like their parent was like the first uh, homozygous person or whatever. And and so that's rare genetic that, variants, and, and yeah, that, it's, it's assumed that everybody probably has like on average five genetic variants that you have that nobody else has five mutations. It just well, yeah. right. So this so this so this is the problem. Like these these uh, so called private mutations that lead to so called severe inborn errors of metabolism. The 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 framework that has been used to look at those is that if you didn't have start having. Um, metabolic catastrophe that put you into the emergency room um, when you were one and instead had it when you were seven, it is benign, right? They, they literally call it benign because, and late onset, because you didn't have your first seizure until you were like seven years old. And so if, if you, if you believe, if you take it at face value that those exist, the idea that you can't also have private mutations that are much less severe that lead to late onset less severe problems at 40 years old is asinine. Like if you can have something that makes someone need a thousand milligrams of pyridoxine to prevent seizures when they're an infant, why can't you have something that makes someone need a hundred milligrams of B6 to prevent you know, something less than seizures, but also dysfunctional that started when they're 35. Like, of course you can, right? So that's part of the problem. And then the other problem is if you do have something, and so to take, what, what do we know with biotin? We know that there's five enzymes that use biotin. There's one or two transporters for biotin, and there's an enzyme that puts biotin into the five enzymes that use it. And there's an enzyme that when those enzymes, that when those enzymes are break it, broken down, it recycles the biotin, right? So there's this collection of, of, of biotin disorders. All of these respond to high doses of biotin. And the reason can, be, can vary from the enzyme that uses it has a low affinity, so needs a very high concentration to normalize, to the transporter is defective. And so you need a very high dose just to get normal levels, right? And so let's say that... Um, but if if you take those like let's say you find someone who's 7 years old who has some kind of metabolic catastrophe and there's all kinds of measurable things wrong in their urine and you give them high dose biotin it generally takes months for all the markers to normalize um but it will take like an hour or two for like the the enzymatic activity in their plasma to normalize so it's like um 
you have this spectrum of like how long does it take for the high dose to work? Let's say someone is profoundly biotin deficient for a dietary reason or because, uh, you know, whatever. It could be a transporter issue or it could be a dietary issue, right? Um, if you give them the normal dietary dose just by analog to that situation, it is probably going to take months for their metabolism to fully normalize. Whereas if you give them a high dose, you're going to you're going to saturate the system much more quickly. The absorption and utilization of high dose is very high, right? So if you let's let's say what you need is your need, your true need is 300 micrograms a day, and you were getting 200 micrograms a day. Uh, if that was the only problem and it persisted for 20 years or 30 years, it could take you months to get the benefit of adding. 300 the to bring your total up to 300 micrograms a day and you might achieve that same benefit way faster by bringing up to one milligram a day so it's not clear that's a pharmacological effect and similarly you can find case reports of i have a case report of taste disorder they couldn't it was like someone's surgery caused a, they couldn't taste anything after their surgery and so they put them on five milligrams of biotin and the taste started coming back. They take it down to one milligram. It starts going away. They take it back up to five milligrams. It starts coming back. And then the person is cured from it. Is that a pharmacological effect of the biotin? Or does that person have you know, a 30% decrease in one of these transporters or enzymes that never manifested until their body went into enough stress from that surgery? Um, and now they need to fix the problem. And they just they fix the problem with five milligrams. That's not necessarily a pharmacological effect. And so I think if you talk about this, like move fast and break things versus be a scientist about it, I think the benefit of the, of the science experiment, experiment approach is that you might find the answer to this, to this. You might not care about the answer to the question, but you might find if you test for it that you have a genuine nutritional deficiency because you have a genuine alteration in your basic need for something. And I think that's, I think that's super useful. I think it could be useful for you to know, but if you're just going to be uh, on high supplements all the time, maybe you don't care, but I think it's, it's like, if I find that that's true for me, I think it would be very useful to the general community to know because, um, uh, I mean, even, even like clinicians should know whether, uh, the bottom third of the normal range for biotin is consistent with all these neuro like modest neurological problems. Right. That's no, awesome. I think there's definitely a, a benefit in knowing, um, and I mean, I guess over time, though, I don't know, I, I, I do like I do do experiments, um, but I'll tell you, uh, I don't for me, I don't know if it's like something with biotin or uh, niacin or folate, because I, I really do think like pretty much uh, across the board, I was, well, I would say uh, B1, B3, uh, B7, B9. Uh, I was deficient on four of those, <laughs> all four of those, right? And and uh, like I'll give you an example with the B1, right? So I took a test for B1 in 2019, and I got a 0.33, and the normal range was 0.5 to 4, right? So I was under the normal range, and so that means that I was deficient. For some reason, I just didn't believe in these tests because I thought that the range changes a lot, and I, I just didn't pay attention to it big mistake but later on i kind of like uh i had the sense that uh, i don't know why but i was like uh, like i was getting anxiety even though i was taking 5 hdp i was like something is wrong here and i remember that i was deficient in b1 and i remember that i did take b1 once and it gave me this certain kind of effect that i really liked but i i stopped taking it i think because it was too strong when i took 100 milligrams and i don't whatever it is but anyway I said, you know what? That it feels like I need that thiamine, and so I took it, and I was like, "Holy crap! This is exactly what I needed." Anyway, um, fast forward to October 2022, I retook the test of B1, and it actually found that I had 1.77, so not deficient. The range is 0.5 to 4. I used to have 0.33, and I was taking about 10x the RDA of uh, B1. So it's taking uh, even more, maybe uh, 50. I don't know exactly, but it was like uh, wait, wait, 25 when it was milligrams. low or between when it was low and when it went to what it's now? So before I took the second result, I was taking about, uh, what was it? It was about 
maybe, I think 20 milligrams of nice uh, of B1. So that's about I think the the RDA is two. Is that correct? Two milligrams. It's uh, it's somewhere around there. Yeah, so it's ten times the RDA I was taking, and I thought this was good. That's what you until, were taking when your when your levels were low. That's what I no no that's what I was taking when my after, levels were one point seven. Yeah, okay, okay. that normalized my yeah. levels. Okay. Um, and I was on this trip, and I, I was you know uh, kind of pounding my nervous system a fair bit, and I I started to feel like hey I'm low on uh, on on thiamine again, <laughs> right? I don't know why because I'm taking thiamine. I took thiamine and it was like, whoa, that just completely went away. This is when it was already 1.77 in my blood. So I wasn't even deficient in my blood. And I still felt like thiamine was having a very good effect on uh, just, you know, just uh, on my general health, on my mood health. And, and uh, so I, I, I just think that like, so thiamine, the RDA was completely off. Um B2, I, I take that uh, because there was a clinical study that showed I have that MTHFR mutation. Didn't never really felt any significant effects, by the way, with a large dosage of that. So, uh, but I still felt like maybe a slight effect, but it could have been the placebo. Nothing significant. B3, massive effects. Um, and then B7, I noticed a very significant effect. B9, I noticed a significant effect. B12, did not know. I'll tell you what I did not notice an effect from. B5, B2, um, and uh, B6 from taking like large dosages. And and it turns out that my levels of B5, B6 were normal. And actually B2 was also normal. So it kind of correlated that, um, I mean, my, my B2, it was 10.7 uh, here. And the range was 1.6 to 68. So I wouldn't say it was like high up on the, uh, the you know, uh, on the level, but it was uh, not bad. And actually, this one came up, um, my B2 went up a lot. And so when I took mega doses of these vitamins that I was in mid-range or higher levels, didn't notice any effect. I was actually in my B6, I was twice what the normal range is on the blood test I'm looking at now. And so, uh, and so when I took it, I just didn't notice any no effect whatsoever, pretty much. I mean, I, I yeah, you know, uh, one of, but when I took all these other ones, noticed the massive effect. Yeah, one of the problems. So I think there's there's I mean two two principles that are important here. One is that uh, it's very possible for for someone to have more than one problem at once, which makes any of the problems <laughs> harder to figure out. Um, and that's even true. Like one one very underappreciated thing with inborn errors of metabolism is that. Uh, you can have carrier status for two different um, for two different inborn errors of metabolism, but the compound heterozygosity creates a a severe inborn error that is almost undiagnosable because of the combination effects, but but is clinically just as bad as being uh, as being um, homozygous for either one of them. I mean, that's not true of c- combining any two. It's just it can be true of certain combinations. Um, the other and similarly with moderate problems. Uh, but the other thing is with the B vitamins, there are so many interactions and that's part of why they're called like B1, B2, B3, et cetera, rather than like vitamin uh, H and G and and so on. And one of them is that many of them are like their absorption is dependent based on ATP trapping in the cell. And the problem with that is that all the B vitamins, especially um, the first seven, but all of them to some degree, are important for ATP production. You know, so you can have a primary deficiency in one that then causes second deficient, secondary deficiency in the others because your ATP levels are dropping, and so you're mm. absorbing a lot less from food because it gets into the cell and it's not trapped by ATP as efficiently because there's less ATP. And so, you know, you, you might find that your levels of uh, your absorption of other B vitamins increases as you fix your weakest link right so it's and then with the in the in the case of thiamine and and um and folate folate is is one of the things that has to be uh recycled using nadph uh which comes from the pentose phosphate pathway which is critically dependent on thiamine that's one of thiamine's key roles and then one thing that is really really interesting is there's a basal ganglia disease um that which is part of the brain that is caused 
specifically by a thiamine transporter defect, and it is treatable with high dose biotin. <laughs> oh, interesting. That's that's kind of wild. Um, but but you know it. But part of the reason is like when you're thiamine deficient, one of the problems you have is that the citric acid cycle activity declines because there are there's a thiamine def, uh, dependent enzyme in the citric acid cycle, which is uh, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. But then the whole citric acid cycle depends on repleting oxaloacetate through pyruvate carboxylase, which is biotin dependent. So it's like you don't have a citric acid cycle if you don't have enough biotin. And mm. the citric acid cycle doesn't run if you don't have enough thiamine. And so even though the primary defect is um, is in thiamine transport, for some, you know, for some reason, biotin co-supplementation profoundly improves the clinical result of thiamine supplementation. And that's probably because you can't you can't get normal thiamine levels, but you can get kind of kind of not profoundly deficient levels. Um, and you you just need to raise up its metabolic partners in order to maximize what you can extract from that benefit. So I don't know that it really tells us anything that there's multiple B vitamins running low across the board. I mean, it's it is interesting. And it's interesting the combination. So you said what, what were the ones that you were deficient in? Thiamine, folate, and uh, the ones that I yeah, based on blood tests and other markers, like the ones that I know I was deficient in is thiamine, niacin, folate. Uh, those those two I'm like for sure defi- I was for sure deficient in. The other ones, uh, folate and, and I biotin, think you have some evidence on biotin as well. Well, I don't know if I was deficient in biotin. Right. I just what I can tell you is that the 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 you were suboptimal were at the low. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe I don't know, but it was <laughs> it was at the lower end of the range. And when I took a high dose of biotin, I felt a very profound effect. Does that yeah. mean I, I, I think you? I, I think you. I think it means yeah. that. Well, remember you were already taking 150 micrograms over and above your diet when you tested and, it, and when you tested towards the low end of the normal range. You know, so take the supplement out, and you might have been closer to where I am, although my food biotin intake is very high, right? So, but if I, if I took the liver and egg yolks out of my, out of my diet, I would be well under the normal range, I think. Um, but you know, you might, you might not have been where I was, but I, it looks, I mean, I, I think in the you test, know, at, did it show that you were under the normal range? Like, because these no, labs I'm in the, have no, like I'm in the bottom, t- I'm in the 10, bottom 10.25% of the normal range. But remember okay. what I was saying before, if I'm right, that it's a, that it's a, a transporter defect. It's, it's not, what's not stunning to me is that I'm there. It's that I'm there despite how high my biotin intake is, right? The normal range is based on normal intakes of biotin. My, my biotin intake is way above the normal just for my food. Um, but you know, if it's a trans, if it's a transporter issue, then the cellular level is going to be underestimated by the plasma level. In any case, I do feel better when, when I don't take methyl – like methylfolate is one of those things that helps the conversion from uh, – uh, first of all, I notice it increases dopamine. I notice it increases serotonin. So I notice it increases dopamine because if I take it at night, I can't go to sleep, right? Um, so things that increase dopamine when I take it at night, it makes it much harder to fall asleep. Things that in- – whereas if I take serotonin, it makes it much easier to fall asleep. So if I just take I, I believe the normal reaction, like the normal healthy reaction to methylfolate is nothing. <laughs> I think so, nothing is the only normal healthy reaction to taking methylfolate. So like if you're not then, deficient in folate and you don't have some kind of weird buffering capacity with methyl groups or something like that, nothing. I don't think anything should happen when you take it. But in order for me to feel an effect, I need to take five milligrams or else i mean like oh you cro- didn't say that part yeah no yeah <laughs> i don't think like if i just take uh, the rda uh, 400 uh-huh. micrograms i won't notice any acute meaning it's probably having an effect it's just that i'm not able to notice it on a conscious level so it's ah, not above the yeah. placebo value like basically right. there's kind of like this level where it's like the placebo where you're like i don't know like i'm feeling a little different but is it the placebo who knows then there's this level like I don't ever feel like this exactly, right? Like this is something that's different of of like significantly different. And then I do that experiment, let's say three times or four times. And if the same thing happens every time, then you, I get some kind of feeling that this is not the placebo effect. If and you really want to placebo control it, if you have a friend you trust, you can uh, 
have them spike yeah. your drink with uh, methylfolate or or uh, cellulose just, powder. Or something. Yeah, it's just not uh, convenient to do. No, it it's that not convenient way. at all. No. It, it takes a lot <laughs> I've never longer. Done and, yeah, and I, I, but but in any case, I do it in this way, and uh, so. But it, but it does take uh, – it could be three milligrams. I don't know. But it, five milligrams is where I start to really notice the difference. Is that a deficiency? I don't know. I, I think no, – No, I, 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 When I said that the normal reaction is nothing, I was, I was thinking in, in 400 the micrograms. milligram range. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean I, I think it's conceivable that you could get a pharmacological neurotransmitter manipulation from a high milligram acute dose – so yeah, um, but the same thing with biotin. If I just take a uh, hundred micrograms biotin, won't notice anything. Take ten milligrams. Yeah, but I don't. Yeah, but right. I don't. I don't buy that as a pharmacological effect because I think you, that you you could be can, you could be fixing a small problem a lot a lot more quickly. I guess the question is whether how like how fast does this wear off? You know, are you talking about something that that lasts an hour long, or, or are you talking about something? Uh, like it lasts where... about um, uh, like ten hours, and and by the way, you just reminded me of something. So when I tried biotin at night, I wasn't able to go to sleep. That's how that's how you know when something gives you energy when you take it in the evening, and you're and it it, it uh, you can't go to sleep. Like it you, it pushes off your time. So like instead of I'll normally start to feel tired at let's say ten p.m. ten thirty p.m. If I take something that's giving me a lot of energy, I won't be able to go to sleep until like 1 a.m you know in the case of nice and it was 4 a.m whatever basically the more energy it gives me um i just took rapamycin and <laughs> actually gave me a shit ton of energy and like i'm sleeping now like i was sleeping five to six hours with without any uh detriment in in my function but it's pushing the amount of time like i'm not i wasn't really getting tired at 10 p.m from because of the rapamycin. How how long did you continue to take one milligram of biotin for? Uh, I'm on it. I've been on it for uh, like a month now. A milligram of biotin. Yeah, and do you have do you have any uh, benefit that's come from it that you're retaining? So that's where you start to get into a little bit of a problem, right? Um, I'm taking like <laughs> eighty stuff, <laughs> literally. Right. Oh, okay. well, this. Yeah. I mean, that goes back to. To my to, to to my you know my approach versus yours and and the trade off there, I you know I think to, the re, the thing is I can't really detect like if one milligram is, I mean first of all there aren't any vitamins that should keep you up at night if you just if you just take them uh, unless it's some kind of pharmacological effect but there shouldn't be any kind of pharmacological of effect of biotin that revs you up like that so my my gut instinct is that you are that your that your brain is is marginally deficient in biotin and that you're normalizing some process that is used to be that is like a, a like calibrated to an abnormally low level of biotin and so you're getting kind of like a an abnormal waking signal just because like some energy pathway perked up that wasn't active that wasn't um as active as it should have been before um and i think the real critical question is like is the biotin doing something that lasts um you know because because if taking it a milligram a day over time is giving you a chronic benefit that's accumulating then i think it's probably fixing a deficiency whereas if the only thing that you get is something that lasts an hour when you acutely take the dose um it it might be a pharmacological effect but it's it's just it's way too hard to tease that out from from the alternative. I think. Well, I I do think that um, like there are clinical trials on benefits. For example, in I know there uh, are but none of them. Yeah, I know. I know. I've I I, I have a I have all of them stacked up right next <laughs> right, to me know, in, sure in printed you know. paper. Uh, <laughs> and and these are people who are presumably not by these, by these, these are people. all these are all randomized controlled trials of high dose biotin uh, right here. Right, but these are people who are not diagnosed with biotin deficiency. Yeah, I know. Yeah, no, I know. I've read them. Uh, <laughs> so look, the problem is n absolutely none of these trials tested the high dose against the lower dose. So that means that none of them mm. have any evidence about the dose at all. Like the, one of the one of the big mistakes that Fair people enough. make is they're like, 
oh, five milligrams of biotin helps diabetes. Therefore, you need five milligrams of biotin to help diabetes. That's total BS. Like if it didn't, if you didn't compare five milligrams to two milligrams, you have no idea whether five milligrams does something that two milligrams doesn't do versus two hundred micrograms. And the the other the other problem is, but I've also like. I have another uh, giant pile of papers to, to to my right on the floor over here. I'm trying to keep them organized so they're in different places that are all on the experimental evidence that there is pharmacological things that biotin does inside cells at high concentrations that it doesn't do normally. And mm. none of these, like I've read all of these papers and they're all thoroughly unconvincing because what they're all showing is that all of these effects occur at doses of biotin that will cause appreciably more of the stuff that biotin always normally does, which is activate biotin-dependent enzymes. So there's no evidence whatsoever that there's any dose of biotin that does something um, different than what nutritional biotin does to activate biotin-dependent enzymes. I'm not saying there's zero evidence that nothing else happens except the activation of those enzymes. I'm saying that no one has ever shown anything happens at a higher dose of biotin than is needed to maximally activate the biotin dependent enzymes there you know so therefore no one has ever shown that there's a pharmacological effect of any dose of biotin and the, and the, and that makes it even more doubtful that if you show 5 milligrams of biotin helps with glucose tolerance in diabetics that um that lower doses wouldn't have been needed but you know the the, the problem is um that I think that everyone is marginally suboptimal in biotin by and large, especially if they're eating a lot of protein. And so you take a diabetic who's been marginally deficient for the last 30 or 40 years and you pop in a high dose, what all you're doing is correcting the deficiency, the marginal suboptimal status uh, just really fast instead of taking six months to do it. So have you ever taken a biotin pill in your life? I've taken five milligrams of, of biotin. Did you feel anything? Well, uh, one time when I, so what that, when I, back when I took the terbinafin, after a few days of it, besides this massive twitching problem, I developed a, a foot drop gait abnormality that I thought was lead poisoning. And late, much later, much later, I, like two years later, after all these problems were gone, I developed this foot drop again. Even my girlfriend at the time noticed it. And I went to a neurologist. What is a foot drop? Had, it's it's like um, I mean it would be easier if you like go on YouTube and and Google uh, I mean you YouTube search it but it's it's sort of like uh, your your uh, it's a gait abnormality so you're not walking right and mm. it's it's like you can't like I I I felt that basically like I had to lift my legs up really high to take a normal step so that the, <laughs> that it didn't like flop okay okay so so it felt like one leg had some kind of uh... I yeah, know, wait on and it. So, and so, and okay. so, so I, um, at the time, I thought I cured myself by taking high all the B vitamins at high doses. That's what I remembered from this. And so, by the time I went to a neurologist, the neurologist was very convinced that it existed because my girlfriend at the time had witnessed it. So she, she was, even though I'm the one who told her that, she put a lot of stock in this. So she ran an, a brain MRI, not, uh, MRI with contrast. She ran a lumbar MRI. She ran a bunch of blood tests. She ran a bunch of like stick electric needles in me tests and couldn't find anything. Of course, I had cured myself with the high dose B vitamins, but I went back into my notes recently. And right before COVID hit, I had graphed up a description of everything that happened that I sent to a doctor who specializes in, in inborn errors of metabolism. And then COVID happened, turned the world upside down. I forgot all about it, never followed up. I went back and I read my email to him and I realized that I was forgetting a detail about how I cured myself with high doses of all the B vitamins. And what I wrote to him that I totally forgot was that I started taking high dose pantothenic acid before it happened. And pantothenic acid interferes with the absorption of biotin. And mm. I didn't, I didn't think through this at the, at the, at the time as a cause, 
but I remember being worried about it. And I, rem- and I still have an app in my phone that is a reminder to take these supplements. I stopped using the app. So it still like gives me these reminders for the past two years. I've been ignoring them and like swiping up. I'm like, get out of my face, but I never go in and change it. And what it says is to take pantothenic acid in the morning and to take lipoic acid at lunch and to take biotin at dinner because and the folk acid also competes, right? There's a transporter. There's controversy over this, but the 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 sort of current dogma is that there's a transporter called the sodium dependent multivitamin transporter, and it transports biotin, pantothenic acid, and lipoic acid. So high doses of one can interfere with the other. So I remember being panicked about whether I was doing something wrong, and I said, "Okay, I'm going to add lipoic acid and biotin, and just in case." the pantothenic acid is hurting their absorption and I'm going to space them out at different meals so that they don't interfere with each other. And so it was actually what I did was when I added the lipoic acid at lunch and biotin at dinner, five milligrams, is that's what cured the foot drop. So, mm. so I, but I, you know, is that a pharmacological effect of the biotin? I don't think so. I think I was just marginally deficient in biotin and I made it a lot worse when I took the high dose pantothenic acid. And then I, and then I cured myself by adding the biotin at dinner. And then I went to the neurologist and she couldn't figure out anything. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. But I have five milligram biotin in my cabinet, you know, and you're way more disciplined than me. Actually, the first thing I would do if I thought I was, yeah. Last thing I actually took, five milligrams of biotin several days in the few months leading up to when my biotin levels were tested that were really low. But anyway, go ahead. And and how did you feel? Any Did you feel a, a significant difference or no? Well, no. I mean, I think that what happened was um, for a religious tradition, I had cut the liver and egg yolks out of my diet for a few months. And what I felt was I was developing like a problem with, uh, I felt like my muscles were getting real tired real fast. I felt like I was getting Parkinson's or something where like, um, you know, but I kept like, I kept like coming up with reasons. I was like, why does my thumb feel so tired? Oh, because I've been sitting here scrolling on my phone. Like I shouldn't be sitting here scrolling on my phone for so long. Um, but, but I, I, well, as soon as I added the liver and I get, well, you know, what happened was, you know, this might be a B vitamin thing. So I felt a lot better when I, when I high dosed all the B vitamins, including the high dose biotin. Um, but then, and, but then I, then after that, I added the liver and egg yolks back in for months before I got my serum levels tested. So it was months of eating a lot of liver and egg yolks and it was, you know, a few days of taking high dose biotin. Um, and so but, I do, but I do what think did you that was feel, a uh, What did you feel acutely when taking the biotin? Were you not able to notice an effect? I, well, I don't know because I took all the B vitamins and I felt mm. I felt better. You know, like I, I felt like the the problem went away. But although that but was you didn't hard take to biotin on its own. No, I didn't. No, I no. At this point, I I felt like I was getting a problem and I was just trying to get rid of it. You went. You the, went the reason. The, I, the reason I could route. take. The reason that I could take months to study what happens to me at this marginal level of deficiency is that I I don't have a neurological problem. Right. But I think if I measured my serum biotin back then, it would have been profoundly below the, the bottom of the reference range, right? Because, because I was not eating the things that, that now have me at the, at the top end of the biotin intake. So I think, I, I think right now I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, right now I feel good. And so, um, but I'm curious if I can prove that, that under the hood, some, there's something, there are things that are like, um, not optimal. What's your LDL cholesterol like? Historically, it's been very low. Although, oh, okay. um, although, like, uh, in the there was one test where it was it was actually really high in the in the post COVID era, but historically, it's been really low. Why? Uh, just curious because you know uh, people who are on animal food diets typically have higher LDL, uh, including myself. Well, uh, well, so you know, one of the things that I've been wondering about is for the last 20 years, whether I have a defect in cholesterol synthesis, because when, when, when my diet was, was 95% animal products with, with mainlining the most cholesterol rich foods and then, and then making like butter and cream, the rest of my diet, uh, my cholesterol would go, would go up to like a max of 160. And when I was vegan, it was, it was 103. Wow. That's the, your total cholesterol. My my LDL total. cholesterol, my LDL cholesterol on uh, with uh, supplements to bring it down went to a peak 
Uh, this is a, uh, uh, 216. This is in 2021. Uh, and I also had it uh, higher before that. To bring it down, to bring it down to 216. Meaning I was already taking certain supplements that were already bringing it down. Right. Because I was right. already, like I was on certain supplements that were bringing it down. I don't think they were bringing it down like 100 points, but they may have been bringing it down like 20 points, 30 points, 40 points. And so, but it, that gives you an idea that if I just wasn't doing anything, it probably would have been on 250, 260, right? Yeah. Very high levels. Um, and high. Uh, I, I, I took a test recently. I got it down to 120. Then I took a test. Um, Your LDL. Uh, yeah, the LDL. Well, wait a second. So, w- w- the other numbers were your LDL? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, wow, that is high. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, so what, I, what I'm curious about is, there, you know, there's different opinions in the health world. And some people think that if you're insulin sensitive and your inflammation is low, which is the case with me, basically like very healthy in all these other ways, do you think that LDL could contribute to heart disease? Um. I mean, my my perspective on heart disease is that it is not so much the concentration of LDL, but it is that the LDL particles oxidize um, and their oxidation is what drives atherosclerosis. And there's a lot of other factors. Um, the The main issue with inflammation is, and you don't have to have systemic inflammation, you can just have local vascular inflammation. And in fact, lipoproteins oxidizing drives vascular inflammation. But the issue with inf- inflammation is atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis creates a plaque, um, and it's usually the rupture of those plaques that drives an event such as a heart attack or stroke. And inflammation uh, degrades the. You, you, what you do is you make collagen to cover up the plaque to try to isolate the oxidized lipids to prevent it from breaking. And inflammation can can degrade the collagen in the fibrous cap. Uh, calcification can make the cap more brittle and more likely to break. Um, but uh, you know, if most people in in the lipoprotein space believe that it is a gradient driven process where higher concentrations of LDL in the plasma create a gradient that leads to LDL moving in the direction of the plaque. And I think that is total BS. Um, And I think that the experimental evidence going back decades was very clear that the cells in the plaque, uh, are they saturate their LDL uptake at LDL concentrations that are way lower than what anyone has. Um, and the only way you can drive their uptake higher is by oxidizing the LDL, which increases their uptake fivefold. And, um, you know, to, no, no one wants to change their mind on this. I've had many, many conversations about it. My, no one has said anything that convinces me uh, towards the concentration end. And I, you know, rarely have I ever convinced someone who's, who like works in this space, you know, like a lipid scientist that the concentration is not the key factor. Um, I've convinced a lot of people who follow my work on the internet, but you know, I've, but like I've, I've worked side by side with people who spent decades on, on the working on the topic. And everyone kind of believes that the more LDL that you have in your blood, the more can oxidize. And I think that's really missing the point, which is that, um, that, and I didn't say this, so let me make this point that, that oxidation of LDL is really, um, a time dependent factor and a um, and a sort of like pr- protection factor. So um, the more protection you have against oxidative stress, the better you are. Um, but if your LDL spends more time in the blood, that's going to be a key driver of oxidation because what happens is it runs out of its antioxidant protection and then it oxidizes. And the the issue with the predictive power of the concentration is... In other words, the reason that people with higher LDLC have a high, have a higher future risk of heart disease in prospective studies, in my opinion, is that uh, the main one of the main ways that you increase LDLC is to slow the uptake of lipoproteins into the into the liver to take them out of the blood via the LDL receptor, and 
when <clears throat> when you slow the uptake of the lipoproteins out of the blood, several things happen. One is that cholesterol is transferred away from HDL to LDL by cholesterol ester transfer protein, which, which decreases HDLC and increases LDLC. Another is that oxidation occurs, which uh, removes phospholipids from the LDL membrane, which makes it smaller and denser. And because they're not being taken up, you have more LDL particles in the blood, so the particle count goes up. So every correlation that has any predictive power with heart disease risk can all be explained by a slower uptake from from the blood. The reason there's a problem with answering your your question in a in a solid way is that um, you might have a higher concentration because you synthesize more uh, more LDL. Um, or you might have a higher concentration because you have sluggish uptake. It's the sluggish uptake that's the problem. And then for a given degree of synthesis and uptake, you might have more or less antioxidant protection and those other processes we were talking about. So go ahead. Okay, but uh, I'm talking about LDL particle number, ApoB, lipoprotein A. Do you, I mean, so, uh, you know, in the, in the Mendelian randomization studies, basically there's a lot of, uh, points of evidence, a lot of lines of evidence showing that it is dose dependent. The higher the ApoB, the more, uh, likely or, you know, more likely someone is to have heart disease, let's say. Right. Um, and, and again, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, you know about all this stuff, so I'm, I don't, but just to review some things, there's animal studies. There's association studies, right? But then there's drugs, a whole bunch of different kinds. That There's statins, PCSK9 inhibitors, bile acid sequestrants. Uh, there's genetic studies. There's Mendelian randomization studies. There's mechanistic studies. There's kind of like a lot of lines of evidence pointing to higher LDL particle count. And LDL cholesterol that they're testing is just kind of a correlation with LDL particle number, ApoB, and maybe some other things. But... My question is, so do you think that the higher LDL particle numbers, higher ApoB, does not influence heart disease uh, or cardiovascular disease or atherosclerosis? It's just influencing just what your oxidized LDL is? Do I have that correct? Or Yes, that's exactly correct. And, and, and that, that covers every single line of evidence that you just cited. So all of the cholesterol-lowering drugs work by increasing the LDL receptor activity in the liver. This is not remotely controversial. Just go to any mainstream explanation of how does a statin or a fibrate lower your cholesterol? A fibrate 100%. lowers- 100%. There's no, yeah. Yeah, it's right, the exactly. the LDL receptor, yeah. Yeah, everyone agrees with that. Um, there's, yeah. the, the genetic evidence is very clear. There's genetic defects in the LDL receptor. There's a genetic e- defects in PCSK9, which degrades the LDL receptor. There's a linear correlation with, with heart disease across the genetic impacts. The animal experiment, same thing. Anything that you do- But your serum, your serum levels are then telling you what your LDL receptors are like, right? So- well, yeah, it, it, it doesn't the, matter. The pro- not really. Yeah. Um, they not okay. really. So, like, the problem is if you have, let's say that you, let's say that like uh, total to HDL cholesterol ratio, or pick whatever your marker is, has a thirty or forty percent R squared correlation with the ten year or twenty year or whatever future risk of heart disease. I'm just making these numbers up. Um, you know, let, it, it's something like that, right? Um, so the, one of the problems is that. If you adjust the lipid markers for each other, they don't give you any more information than that, right? So there's, uh, you know, maybe you're winding up with like 30% of the variation in heart disease risk explained by this. Um, now, that doesn't in and of itself hurt the um, argument that that it's the concentration that matters. Um, but, you know, because it could be the concentration that matters that accounts for 30 or 40% of the risk and then the inflammation, calcification, all the other stuff is the other the other part that accounts for it. The problem is, is is that that also means that there is some two thirds of the variation in your lipoproteins that's not giving you that information. In other words, um, you know, there is there's a component of the variation of the lipid parameters that explains a component in the risk that that. Also, it, that on, not only does that tell you that there's components in the risk that aren't explained by the lipid parameters, it also tells you that there's components of variation in the lipid parameters that don't tell you anything about that risk, or at least it's it's consistent with that possibility. Um, 
And I mean, you don't know that that's the case, but it, but it, it may well be the case. Um, and so if my, my model for looking at it would be that the component of blood lipid parameters that is explained by LDL receptor activity is what's actually driving that risk. And that if, if you alter the blood lipids in a way that doesn't interfere with clearance rate, so for example, you increase cholesterol synthesis without decreasing the clearance rate, you will not contribute to heart disease. That would be my, that would be my, that would be my testable hypothesis to. Okay. To I see what you're saying. Okay. So you're saying if somebody eats a high animal food diet, they're increasing cholesterol synthesis, but it's likely that their clearance, but they're not changing their clearance rate. So therefore their cholesterol is going up. Well, but that not doesn't necessarily. So, sa- so saturated fat does decrease LDL receptor activity. So if you increase cholesterol oh, synthesis okay. in the liver, you'll have higher free cholesterol in the liver, which will decrease LDL receptor activity. And then the other, the other so you issue- you seem to agree that uh, eating more saturated fats is going to increase the uh, risk of heart disease or cardiovascular disease because it's reducing it the LDL receptors. It could in some receptors. people. It could in some people. Right, not you. But, if your but look, LDL but look, is already look, super there, low. Yeah, but the, but the issue with fats is that there were several decades where they did many randomized controlled trials of replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat. Most of those trials were very poorly designed. And if you take the ones that 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 the handful that looked quite specifically at that single variable, they miserably failed to show that there is a benefit to heart disease risk. And I think that part of the reason is that more that saturated fat versus polyunsaturated fat will tend to decrease LDL receptor activity, but it will also tend to decrease the vulnerability of the lipoprotein to oxidation because you have less PUFA in the LDL membrane. And Daniel Steinberg, who is the author of a history called Cholesterol Wars, the Skeptics versus the Preponderance of the Evidence, and was also uh, basically one of the chief architects of the NIH consensus that cholesterol causes heart disease, um, his argument was always what what he was he played a major role in the in the elevation of monounsaturated fat to sort of darling status for a time because his argument was uh, if if PUFAs increase LDL susceptibility to oxidation um, but saturated fats raise the LDL concentration by slowing the LDL receptor activity MUFAs would be the most neutral fat because they're less likely to slow LDL receptor activity and also don't do anything to increase its propensity to oxidize. Um, But look, I I think there are so many factors here that I think the issue is, is, like the overall issue is um, you're playing a certain level of risk if you want to say that the correlations that are observed in the general population don't apply to you because there are different contextual factors. Because we don't have the studies that really look at, and you know, some people are working on that. Like with the stuff that Dave Feldman is doing is trying to divorce, like what happens when you have this LDL concentration on a totally different diet. And I think that's great work. We need it, um, you know. But we have very robust findings from decades of of very large prospective studies mapping out how it usually works in the general population. One thing that's missing from that is that we also have studies from. Uh, the Pacific Islands, where on the island of Tokelau, they had no heart disease and they had the highest saturated fat intake in the world from coconut. And the males had total cholesterol levels around mean of 220. So that maybe means that the population distribution was a mean male cholesterol between like 180 and 250-ish. And so you Which is not that, that high. 220 is fine. It's not that high, but it's higher than the reference range, right? So if you ask like the average the average lipidologist are going to say like you need a statin if you're at 250 but well but they say under 200 not... is what a lipidologist would say right correct and so i mean that that's the reference range right so but so what i'm saying is like the reference range is overdone um you know but if i if my total cholesterol was 300 i i wouldn't even i'm not sure i would even care what my ldl cholesterol is because because the reality is like it's very hard to get uh, a cholesterol over 300 without having heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia and or thyroid disorder um and at that point you are uh you know the the data that we have says you're at increased risk of heart disease 
And look, I, if you want to play the game of risk uh, of saying like, I'm doing things different, I think what you want to do is develop some evidence of it. So a lot of people use coronary calcium scans. I think a much better detector of an early disease risk would be carotid IMT, which is fairly accessible because calcium is a late stage atherosclerotic risk and uh, thickening is an early stage risk. And if you want to be really um, proactive about it, I think that if you could get your flow mediated dilation uh, tested, which I think would be hard to find maybe in a, at a university, that's where they squeeze the forearm and then they and then they let it go and they measure how fast does your blood vessel dilate to rush blood back to the forearm. And then things you can easily measure at home like heart rate variability and, and blood pressure um, and and pulse and and exercise tolerance and things like that. I think if all those ducks are in a row, um, and you never, you know, you never develop endothelial dysfunction. You never develop a thickened uh, uh, plaque on a carotid INT, and you ne- never develop any calcium scannable on a calcium scan. I think you have a pretty strong argument that your LDL is fine because you have all these other ducks in a row. Um, it's just that we don't have we don't have enough data to say that. So I think you're you're we have reasons to believe it might be true. Um, and I, I support looking at those things and I, and I might do the same thing that, that you would do um, and that I just said I would do if, if that were my situation rather than my cholesterol being hard to get above total 160. Um, right. And, you know, and I, I, there, I have numerous friends um, and clients who take that approach um, and I, you know, I'm very, I'm very open to that. But I, I do think so- like, I do think you want to measure the metrics, you know. So to to sum it up, and and I th- I think we agree here. Uh, I I think what you're saying is there's a lot of metrics that are important that you can measure. LDL uh, particle number ApoB these are one of the metrics, and we don't have enough information to say whether increased ApoB or LDL particle number with that you know with uh, with if all the other met- measures are normal or optimal that these are going to be harmful, but Theoretically, it could be. We just don't know. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess it's a personal decision if you want well, to. I, well, I think the mechanistic evidence is super clear that it is not the concentration of lipoproteins and it is the oxidation of lipoproteins that drives atherosclerosis. I think the people who argue otherwise are, are just misinterpreting all of the data by not taking into account the cellular studies that we have on what drives the individual processes happening inside the plaque, like the macrophage LDL. Uh, so I, I talked to but my, you're also saying though, that you're also saying that, uh, it, it there's also, uh, you're saying that the level of lipoprotein number concentration is not affecting the amount of oxidation, correct? Yes, although the pro, but the processes that typically raise someone's LDL number are right. So it's a marker rather than a causal factor, and so that means that you could divorce it if you divorce yourself from the context in which those markers have typically been measured to be predictive of risk. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is, it's my point isn't that we don't have enough information. It's that we can't measure in you the rate at which your LDL is oxidizing. You can measure your oxidized LDL, but no one has validated that as a as a marker of the dynamic process of LDL oxidizing to get into a plaque. And so we can't measure that. Then, you know, I can't tell you whether your uh, 200 LDL-C is driving atherosclerosis, except to look at whether you have atherosclerosis. And since you can look at whether you have atherosclerosis and you can look at some of the other predictors um, like endothelial function and heart rate variability um, and blood pressure, uh, then I think that you can... Um, you can for yourself say, all right, I'm going to take this into consideration. I'm looking at these other factors and I'm also going to be proactive about measuring whether this process is happening in me. Um, and you know, I think if, if you're developing atherosclerosis, uh, then you, you want to rethink that. And if you're not, then I think you're in a, in a good camp. Um, but it's, it's just that we don't, there's no, although I believe that it's, oxidation and not concentration that drives atherosclerosis, there's nothing testable in any individual where we can say, you are not oxidizing your LDL. And so therefore, we have to fall back on the lipid markers that we have to predict the probability of what's happening. And if you want to argue that 
I'm not the probable case based on those numbers, then I think you just need to use the other markers you have available and markers of the actual disease process to say, hey, my arteries are clean. But in any case, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we went way over uh, the time. Um, I really appreciate that. I feel like I could talk to you for a long time. I had like a bunch of other topics and we can we'll have to do again like, sometime. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I really like talking to you because you really do have a lot of good information. Thank I you. I feel like, um, yeah, it's, I, every time I talk to you, I learn quite a lot. So had really, really good stuff. Well. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming on and uh, yeah, have a great day. Cool. You too, man. Hope you enjoyed this. Please subscribe. Please like. Please review. Whatever it is, YouTube, you like. iTunes, review it. And this way, I will do more of it if I see that people are really liking this stuff.